will record this meeting. I assume there will be at least some students who will miss it. So this way, those who cannot attend today live uh, will be able to watch the recording. Um, all right, so a little bit about maybe myself first and then about you just to kind of um, make it a little easier. So my name is Vas. Uh, you don't have to call me Professor Karas or Dr. Karas. You can just call me Vas. Um, as you can tell by my accent, uh, I'm not from the United States, although I've, I've lived here for most of my life. Um, I was born in Ukraine, uh, which is not that far from Lithuania. Uh, I left Ukraine at the age of 16 to study in Germany. And then since then, it's been many countries, many places uh, before I ended up here in the United States. Uh, notably, I did my master's in, um, at the University of um, Texas at Dallas and lived there for a few years. Uh, then spent quite some time in Canada, uh, where I did my PhD at the University of Calgary, uh, Western Canada, and also taught there for a while. And my last big stop <clears throat> has been here in North Carolina, it's been now 11 years at the University of North Carolina here in Greensboro. And so all this time I've been teaching, studying, researching international business. So that's basically what I do. And um, yeah, that's briefly about myself. My area of specialization is um, a little bit more on the sort of human side. So managing people in international context. My master's and my undergraduates both were more in economics. So I used to be pretty good with numbers and functions and formulas, <clears throat> taught statistics for a long time. But um, over time, um, moving from one country to another, <clears throat> doing some research in this area, I ha have developed more interest in sort of the human side, in the software side. Uh, all my relatives, father, mother, brother, they are engineers. And sometimes they sort of make fun of me because they find um, Sort of psychology and management uh, to be not real science. Uh, they think that only natural sciences are real sciences and they sometimes make fun of me. Uh, but it is my conviction or at least my experience so far uh, that uh, in business, for example, you can have uh, the best strategy, you can have the most funding, you can have, uh, I don't know, big flashy office and equipment. But if the people don't work well with one another, all of that would not matter. And so while in my sort of previous life, uh, I would write a lot of numbers and I would do a lot of calculations to sort of describe what's going on in the, you know, in the organization sort of numerically. Uh, lately, I, as I said, I've come, come to the conclusion that this human side matters equally much or maybe even more. And so most of my research has been on basically what happens when people from different cultures, people from different countries come together. What can go wrong? What can go well? Uh, how do you make, you know, minimize the problems and maximize the potential? Uh, and so that's basically what uh, my team has been researching, researching lately a lot. <clears throat> One of the areas that I'm very interested in is also um, um, evaluation of effectiveness of um, different training programs and HR initiatives. What I mean by that is that um, very often organizations hire consultants, often they hire me to run all kinds of team building exercises or some other team development uh, programs, or sometimes they would implement a new system of, I don't know, compensation <clears throat> or performance management uh, or performance appraisal. And so what usually doesn't happen in those cases is in most cases, organizations would not do an assessment of whether or not uh, this intervention, this program, this training actually makes a difference. And so it's kind of funny that organizations would spend thousands and thousands of dollars asking you to help them, but then they would not be interested in whether or not it actually made a difference. So for every dollar they invested in the program, how many dollars they get back, uh, let's say within half a year or one year. So I do a lot of research of that kind. And as I said, a little surprised that in most cases, unless you actively promote that idea, the companies don't even ask you to do it. So, but that's a whole different story. And another area of my interest uh, lately has been um, uh, crowdsourcing. And by crowdsourcing, I mean this uh, new form of organization where a huge number of people from all around the world come together uh, to solve some problems. So good, a good example that you all are familiar with would be, uh, for example, Wikipedia. So there was this um, book or publisher, the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
uh, had been around for about 250 years. Very popular, the biggest encyclopedia, extremely respected, written by hundreds if not thousands of professionals. So hired people who have a contract and they have to write an article about something. Very, very popular, very influential. And then a few years ago, um, Wikipedia comes, comes along. So Wikipedia, as you know, it's not professionally written. written. It's written by essentially, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of amateurs. I wrote a couple of articles myself. I made numerous comments and, you know, corrections of existing articles. Everyone, like myself, contributed, you know, a few minutes here, a few minutes there, so nothing special. And then, boom, like three, four years, and Wikipedia becomes so big that the Encyclopedia Britannica decides to basically stop publishing their book, you know, in paper, on paper, and now they only publish it online. But even there, I mean, when was the last time you read the Encyclopedia Britannica? So Wikipedia, we go there every day. The uh, and Wikipedia, again, is kind of crowdsourced, you know, written by amateurs. The Encyclopedia Britannica, written by professionals, uh, not, really, not really that successful anymore. Uh, obviously, you see the same effect with, um, for example, um, uh, Uber, uh, where a sort of a crowdsourcing platform for um, taxi services essentially takes the market share away from the real professional taxi drivers. Same thing, for example, with um, uh, Airbnb uh, that are taking away the market share from the classic hotels and so on and so forth. Uh, can I ask you guys, let's see if you know, uh, what has been the largest collaboration project in the human history? So can you think of a project that involved the largest number of people contributing to the same cause? Like if you look historically, you know, in the ancient times, probably the biggest project was uh, the, the Egyptian pyramids. It has been estimated that probably about 100,000 people have worked uh, on building those pyramids at any given time. Then when we came to uh, going to the moon, uh, the NASA project, uh, you know, shooting the rocket to the moon and bringing those people back, it was about a million people who have been helping in one way or another with, with that mission. You know, not all of them obviously worked for NASA, but, but, you know, they contributed in one way or another. So if I had to ask you, what has been the largest, biggest international collaboration project where everybody contributed to the same cause? Can you think of that example? Let's see if you know your history. In fact, I will even tell you that some of you could have participated in that project without knowing it. Anyone? What are your thoughts? I'll give you a hint. It was about one and a half billion people who contributed to the project. Anyone? Um, have you ever gone to your bank account, for example, or tried to log in into some sort of a website and it would give you some random letters or word that looks kind of funny and asks you to recognize that word and type what that word means just to make sure that you're not a robber. CAPTCHA. Anyone know what CAPTCHA is? So if you, in fact, let me show you what that is. I guess we should be talking about the course, but uh, I guess it's perfectly CAPTCHA. So um, if we, uh, let me share it with you. Yeah. So if you ever went to a website and you saw something like this, let me share the screen. So, um, oops, this one. So, if you ever saw something like this, like these, you know, like scrambled letters, where you had to, uh, like, like something like this, where you had to see, you know, to guess what that word means and enter it. In fact, that this is the classic example. Like that's the best example of capture. Oops, like this picture here. Um, so, you usually would be asked to recognize two words. And so what that was, was it was a collaboration between this company called CAPTCHA and Google. Uh, as you know, Google now has millions and millions of books available in electronic format on Google Books. And so uh, the way it worked was that they literally went to the library, they hired a lot of people, and those people were just standing with the copiers and scanning them, or scanners, and scanning those books to, to, you know, to, uh, to digitalize them. And then those books ran through this algorithm that recognized text and uh, basically, you know, Google uh, then had them in text format. But the problem is that sometimes the computer would not fully recognize the words. I mean, the computer is good at text recognition, but some words were difficult. And so um, what Google did, they, they teamed up with CAPTCHA and they um, uh, would take and give you each time two words. One word is the word that they know. And that word is the one that they actually use to test if you are a robot or actually a human trying to access the website. 
but the second word would be the word that Google computers could not recognize. And so they ask you humans to, to, to look at that word and type it up. And so they would give the same word to like three, four people. So this way, uh, you know, as long as the you know, operators agree, we know that that's probably the word. But without knowing that for many years, every time you log into your web account, uh, your I don't know, email account or your bank account or wherever else Captcha is asking you to enter that word, Every time you're trying to recognize the word and prove that you're not a robot, you're actually helping Google recognize that text and uh, digitalize the, the books. And so that was a big project. And so over a billion people participated in that project. Again, in most cases, without even knowing that they were parts of, uh, part of that you know, collaboration project. But anyway, fascinating topic. And that's something I'm trying to study now because it's inherently international. And so it creates all kinds of interest in managerial challenges as well as um, lots of interesting um, sort of organizational science type of, you know, questions revolving around that. So, but that's basically about me. And then I have a few questions about you guys, and I'm not sure what the best way would be to answer it. So I guess if you shout, I should be able to hear you. But uh, question one, I was given a list of students and it's 30 students and apparently all of them are from Vilnius. And from my previous experience, I've told this course a few times, we always have some international students through the Erasmus program. So do we have any Erasmus students this time? If you are not a Lithuanian, oh, we have quite a few. Okay, <laughs> no problem, no problem. So uh, let me ask you a few questions because I'm trying to make some decisions here. One, uh, with Erasmus students, we had two problems. One, not all of them had uh, their Vilnius, account, Vilnius University accounts. So do all of you have your Vilnius University email address? If you do have the email address, raise your hand, or let's do it the other way. Do any of you not have the Vilnius address? So all of you, okay, so you have it. Now, second question, my experience in the past has been that many students do not like to use the university address, and many students prefer to use Gmail or Hotmail or whatever else you use. Now, raise your hand if you strongly prefer to use the Gmail, Hotmail, basically non-university address. Do we have any students like that? So we have, ooh, most of you. Okay, okay, so that's, that's what happened in the past. And so um, what we will do, we will do two things. Oh, and another thing, uh, does anyone have trouble accessing uh, Moodle or do not like using Moodle or do not have an easy way to access Moodle? Do we have anyone like that? Okay, at least Moodle is not a problem. In the past, we had problems with email addresses. So many students either didn't have the university address or were given one too late, or uh, the second, uh, you need the key? Uh, could, be, could be in the car. Yeah, so, um, all right. So, um, so many students had difficulties using the email address. And so what we will probably do with that is, I will send you a form to your university address, uh, which I already have. Check it sometime today, and then in that form, there will be a, basically I will ask you to your, your private private email address, and it doesn't matter to me which one we use, but I need to have it. And apparently, the university doesn't have both of your addresses. And then sometimes when they give me your private address, they misspell it, uh, add an extra letter, miss a letter, and then obviously it wouldn't work. So uh, this time I will send you a form right after the session. And I will ask you if you would like to use a different email address instead. I will just ask you to answer that. Shouldn't be a problem. And then that will be the one that I will send you all the correspondence to. Same thing with Moodle. So we'll have to see how things work this semester. I will post all of the materials on Moodle. But at least in the past couple of years that I taught this course, there have been always little problems here and there. And I'm not sure if that's lack of my proficiency with Moodle or students didn't like it very much, but there were always little glitches. We always were able to fix them, but there was always little problem here and there. And so what I'm thinking this time, and I will show you the links in a minute, what I'm thinking this time is that I'll probably give you direct links to everything that we use in the course, uh, materials, readings, uh, exams. And so all of them will be in the syllabus that I will go over in the next few minutes. And so this way you will have that one PDF file and everything you need, there will be a link there. So if you need to take a homework assignment, you just click on this link. If there is um, you know, something you need to read, you just click on that link. And so this way, uh, we may not even need Moodle, uh, at least not you know, absolutely necessary. Uh, I will still post everything on Moodle, so don't worry if you prefer to access all of this stuff through Moodle, no problem at all. But I think that will make it a little bit easier in case we have some problems with login and stuff like that. So those are administrative issues. And um, other than that, let me go through the course um, 
outline. And so let's try to make it more into a discussion. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, feel, feel free to ask them as we go and we will discuss all of this together. So let me open the, share the screen one more time. So you see the PDF file here, right? So uh, you, you see the text file on your screen, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, all right, wonderful. All right, so a few things uh, administratively, I mean, the course is online and I always wish, I let me take, take this off. I always wish uh, we were able to, to do it face to face, but the problem is the timing is such that it's always difficult for me to leave my work here and come to Lithuania for a week or two. So I guess we'll do it online virtually this time as well. Although, as I will talk a little bit later, we have a big, um, so a big component of this course is what we call the Exculture Project. And sort of the best students who complete the Exculture Project are invited to a face-to-face, -face, we call it a symposium, a global symposium. So this year it will be in Singapore, and so at least some of you will be invited. And so I hope that at least some of you I will be able to meet in July in Singapore. Uh, we'll see how things go. Um, now, in terms of communication, here in the syllabus, I emailed it to you yesterday. Um, uh, so you have my phone. It's also my uh, WhatsApp and Viber, and I'm not sure what, what app is most popular in Lithuania. But feel free to call me if you need me. Uh, I should be available most of the time. The only problem here, obviously, is the time zone difference. So uh, depending on the time of the day, I may not be available and may literally be sleeping. But if it's an emergency and you need to talk to me, you have my direct contact, so feel free to use it. Uh, the best method to contact me, obviously, would be email. Uh, I usually reply pretty quickly, uh, but hopefully it will be no more than a couple of days if, you know, if it's not an urgent matter. But that's probably the most reliable way to reach me. And then you have my Skype. Again, not sure how many of you prefer Skype, but um, if you need me, uh, here is Skype. Now, one thing I will do is um, every Saturday, you are 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., basically this hour, I will keep my phone near me and I will call it a virtual office hours. So it will not be a formal meeting, not something that you must attend, uh, but I will be online during that time. So if you have questions and you need to talk to me and you need to make sure that I'm available, that hour I will always have my phone near me and will not book anything else. So if you need to talk to me, just call me during that time using any of these tools, phone, Skype, Viber, uh, WhatsApp, and uh, I will be available and we'll just talk. So we'll have a one-on-one -on -one meeting or if it's multiple people, we can even have a group meeting. So um, we'll do it that way. Textbook. Uh, in my own course, I use this textbook called International Business, um, The Challenges of Globalization by Wild Wild, and it used to be Wild Wild and Hen. And apparently now the hen person, you know, the third author died, retired. So the latest edition has only um, uh, two co-authors. Now, I checked, and you have this book, an older edition of this book, in your library. So if you want to read it there, you can get it there. Uh, the editions 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are virtually identical. So they included some new statistics, some new numbers, but overall it's basically the same textbook. And again, I'm not sure if you want to buy one, but if you would like to buy one here in the United States on eBay, you can literally find it for like $2. The only problem is I'm not sure how much it will cost to ship to Lithuania if you want to get a hard copy. Um, I will see, maybe I will even ask my assistant to maybe scan some of the chapters that would be very beneficial for you to read. So this way you will be able to read the electronic version. So we'll see, I need to check with the publisher about the uh, permissions. I think we are allowed to scan up to one third of any book and distribute to the students without any problems. But if it's more, uh, the copyright issues may be a problem, so we'll have to see. But as I said, you have a hard copy in, in your library. Unfortunately, it's only one, apparently, from what I see. Uh, but then, as, an, as a substitute, I found another textbook that covers basically the same topics. And this one is available for free online. So if you use this link, if you go to that uh, website, uh, you have the whole book here in the PDF file format. And so uh, you can use that one. Uh, what's interesting about international business is that, like many other subjects, it's a kind of standardized, established uh, subject with a good tradition, just like ma mathematics, for example, or biology or, or physics. No matter which textbook you take, it basically covers the same topics. Like if you go to, I don't know, physics, whatever you know, uh, type of physics it is, it will probably cover the same things. Like let's say if it's basic physics, you will have something, you know, like force and, you know, inertia and, you know, the laws of motion and that kind of stuff. 
Same thing here. So every author talks about it a little bit differently, but when it comes to the actual topics, they're pretty much the same and uh, you know, all the concepts are discussed uh, in every textbook. So uh, this one covers most of the things that we need for the course and it's free, so you can use that one. But then also I checked you have like four other textbooks, international business textbooks at your library. And again, I even give you here the, the, the call numbers. Again, as I said, I know all of those books, read right? all of them, and they are all pretty much, you know, they cover sometimes in a different order, sometimes slightly different, uh, you know, perspectives, but more or less the same list of topics. So all of those would be good. And um, in the schedule later on, I will even tell you which chapter and which textbook you need to read, depending on which one you have. So try to get the textbook if you would like to read it. But if you don't want to bother with the textbook, not a big problem. We will have a series of video lectures for every lecture. And so as long as you watch those video lectures, that's all you need. Uh, so I cover pretty much everything you need for the course. Plus, um, my slides are deliberately, and you already have access to them again in the syllabus, I deliberately made them um, wordy, a lot of text. So they almost look like class notes. So full sentences in most of the cases, so it's a lot of text. And the reason for that is that um, if I were teaching this course in face-to-face -face settings, I would make my slides, uh, you know, brief, lots of pictures, uh, little text. So my, my goal would be to sort of convince you uh, of something or keep you captivated, keep, keep your attention on me. In that case, I would use more graphics. But because it's an online course, I thought it would be bet better if the slides contained more text. So this way you can use the slides as class notes. So if you don't want to read the textbook, but if you, you know, listen to the lecture a long time ago and you need to quickly review everything before the exam, you can use the slides. Uh, so it basically, you know, a lot of text and you can probably review each lecture in like 10, 15 minutes just by reading what's on those slides and you will have all the main definitions, all the main concepts. So it's deliberately designed to be detailed enough so you can actually read them. So it's not only just a list of topics and a picture, but actually full text so it gives you kind of like a con condensed version of the, of the lecture, of the chapter, book chapter. Course objectives, um, lots of sort of, you know, important stuff here. You will read it on your own. Um, what I would like to say about sort of the goals of the course or what the course is, um, some courses that I teach are sort of how-to courses. So in those courses, we discuss how to do things. Like, for example, I used to teach statistics, and in statistics, we talked a lot about how to uh, you know calculate some you know estimates uh, predictions numbers formulas in this course it's more about what is so the the course is more about how international business works so um what are the different uh, theories what are the different measures what are the different institutions uh, that operate in this environment in this domain we will have a strong how-to component, so we will have a strong practical component. I will talk about it a little bit later. And as well as we will have a few lectures that will be a little bit more how-to, like for example, we will start with a sort of, you know, the country level. So we will talk first a little bit about, you know, political systems, economic systems, institutions that govern international finance, international trade. So those will be more introducing you to this world so that you know how it works. But as we move, lower to the key, uh, to the company level, to the firm level uh, strategy, that's where you will start seeing some how to. So how do you design a strategy? What strategies exist? How do you choose one that is best for you? Um, international market entry modes. Again, it's more kind of explaining to you what options you have when you're going to a new market. But to some extent, it already gives you some advice, you know, how you would enter a new market. But then the last few lectures will be about HR, basically human side of the international business. And that's where you will have some more how to. So, you know, how do you hire people? How do you select people for international assignments? How do you compensate people in, 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 in international kind of organizations or settings? So at this stage, it will be a little bit more how to, although again, the goal here is not to teach you how to do things, but rather explain to you how things operate so that when you have your own business or you work for a company and you have to do business internationally, you sort of know what you got yourself into. You know how this environment is structured, uh, who the players are, what institutions govern it, what laws are around you. And so basically this way you will be able to navigate your way a little bit easier, a little bit better. Um, so that's the goal. Um, 
the topics that we will cover here generally are, as I said, we go from globalization, but then we will talk a lot about international sort of differences um, among the countries, you know, the different political systems, uh, how Lithuania is different, for example, from the United States in the political domain, uh, economic systems, cultures, all kinds of things that we need to know about the national differences so that when you go to a different country as a business person, you sort of have the framework, you know what to pay attention to, you know what to use, what indicators to use to analyze that market and know your way around. And as I said, then we will talk a lot about the firm level, um, international business strategy, international market entry modes, international finance, uh, international monetary system, those kinds of things that are more kind of useful for you as a business person, business manager, employee, uh, international team members, and th things that you need to know in that level. And then we sort of move further kind of lower down in the sort of, you know, uh, daily tasks. And we'll get in things like international marketing, very important, uh, then international HR, compensation, selection, recruitment, all kinds of things like that, all the way to international teams. And then if we have time, we will even talk a little bit about immigration. It's a very big, important topic, uh, usually falls more in international economics and sociology as opposed to uh, international business but because it's such a hot topic now everywhere so in uh, the united states in europe with all the brexits so immigration is kind of one of the important contentious issues there i thought it would be beneficial if you were able to sort of you know review uh, some of the empirical evidence and theories of immigration so when people from other countries come to your country for example or when you go to a different country what happens and so the goal there will not be to talk about whether or not immigration is good or bad uh, whether you should or should not you know welcome immigrants uh, it will be purely about uh, sort of economic effects of immigration so when people move from one country to another uh, what happens you know how does that affect unemployment how does that affect uh, demand for products how does that affect wages how does that affect uh, the competitiveness of the nation so we'll talk about all those issues and some of them are positives and some of them are negatives. So I'm not going to present you one way and say, oh, it's good or no, it's bad. No, there are some benefits and some negatives. And you know, some things may be beneficial for you, but negative for others and the other way around. As they say, there is this expression uh, in English, uh, they say, where you stand depends on where you sit. So your position on something depends on your role in this situation. And so if you happen to be maybe a business owner, then perhaps it's good for you. But if you happen to be an employee, maybe it's bad for you. So things like that. So we'll talk about those things. Um, course format, um, it's online, as we said. But in terms of video lectures, as I said, um, for each lecture, for each topic, there will be a video lecture. And so for now, I put them on YouTube. So this way you can watch them, basically click on the link and stream. But if you would like to have MP4 files, uh, again, I give you here a couple of links. These services, you just plug the link and it allows you to download the full MP4 file. So this way you can watch it offline whenever you want, or you can keep it for yourself if you need it in the future. But um, I will also, as long as Moodle works, they said that I will get access to the uh, Moodle platform tomorrow. So as long as everything's fine, I will also post them on Moodle. The only, here, uh, the only caveat here is that in the past, Moodle had a restriction on how much, uh, you know, how big a file I can post there. And because these are video files, I think it's about like a gigabyte per video lecture or something like that. And so in the past, Moodle had a restriction and would not allow me to post more than two gigabytes, I believe. And so I could not just simply could not put the whole video lecture or it says actually here 100 megabytes per file. I think it may be different now, so I'll check it out tomorrow. Uh, we use Canvas here at my university. so. Uh, maybe it's different now, so if they allow me to put the whole file, great. If not, you have the YouTube high definition, you can download them and uh, watch them at that time. Um, so most of the video lectures are about one hour long. Uh, so some topics took me a little bit longer to cover and some were a little bit shorter, but about an hour per video lecture. Plus I have your PowerPoint presentations. Again, I'll show you in a minute where to find them. As I said, I designed them to be essentially like a you know mini many textbook chapter. So essentially almost like a, a you know, condensed uh, version of the chapter or class notes. So you will be able to use them and uh, uh, watch them. Uh, live video sessions, we will have five meetings with you. 
three meetings like the one today on Tuesdays. Uh, so we will basically have one before each of the tests. So we will have the introduction today and then we'll have one before each of the tests. So it will make four. And then we will have also a meeting uh, before Exculture starts. So, and I'll talk about Exculture in a minute so you know what that is. But there will be one meeting that we will have uh, as an orientation to the whole project. It will be on a Saturday. Uh, right before the project starts and so then one will be open to everybody who participates in the project but obviously you are invited to be there as well and it will be exactly the same as it is today with the only difference is that there will be many other people also watching at the same time so we will have that session and then we will have one more session related to exculture towards the end of the project when you will have probably a lot of questions and when you will have a lot of um, uh, I don't know, whatever may be happening you know uh, uh, challenges you will need feedback on your work before you submit your work so we'll have another lecture uh, meeting like that and then in addition we will have um, uh, a lot of webinars with um, the client companies that participate in Exculture again I will talk about that in a few minutes but uh, so there will be this project and so there are about 10 businesses 10 international companies each one from a different country that participate in this project and so we have webinars again just like this one with the managers, the CEOs, the owners of those companies. And so again, uh, you are most welcome and encouraged to, uh, to attend those lectures. And when you do, again, most of the discussion will be between the company representative and usually me. Sometimes it will be somebody else, another professor managing the meeting, but most of the time it will be me and the company owner or business, uh, one of their representatives but you guys will be there live as well and so if needed we will be able and uh you know to engage and talk uh, to one another and uh so it will be basically like a round table meeting so we'll have uh three meetings plus this one with you only two more meetings with other students and probably about 10 meetings where there will be mainly the focus on the business but you will also be able to communicate with us if you have any questions you will be able to ask them live and so that will make, will make a total of what, about a dozen, 12, 13, 14 meetings total. And so my hope is that that will create the uh, sort of the, the, the sense of more or less a life course. So it's not just something where I tell you, read the book and do the tests, but actually we do have opportunities to communicate on, on, on a more or less regular basis. Still not the same if we were in the same room and were able to talk, but you know, that's the best we can do with the technology today. Um, the course mark, again, this is how I will, so all of the assignments that you will do, I will score them on a 100 point scale. But uh, then I will weigh them like this. So like the first exam will be worth 20%, next exam 20% and so on and so on to a total of 100. But I believe your university asks me to provide the grades in a uh, numeric, uh, I mean one to 10 scale. And so this is how we will convert it. So if you get 95 or more, you will get a 10 and so on and so on, so we'll stick with that. Historically, uh, in your course, students get sevens on average, but many get eight, many get nine, many get 10. Uh, hardly anybody goes below six, but I always have one or two students who for some reason just kind of disappear in the middle of the semester. In fact, funny enough, I mean, uh, I, I don't even know what to make out of it, but I got an email about a week ago from a student who took this course last year, last, like a year ago. And the student says, hey, professor, I missed one test and I failed one test. I did not have the time to prepare or something. So I basically got, you know, like 50 for one test and zero for another one. And because of that, I got a failing grade. So can I retake the tests? And so I made the arrangements. The school said, you can, as long as you allow me to. I'm like, okay, well, it's been a whole year if you still remember the material. Sure, go ahead. And so the student retook the test literally like a year later. And so we will now change the grade. I mean, that's not something I would like to see, but what I mean here is that there are always one or two or three students, like, well, everybody gets like eight, nine, ten usually, maybe some get seven or even six, there would be always a couple of students who don't seem to care during the semester, and then by the time they sort of wake up, they're like, oh, I need to do an exam, it's almost too late, so hopefully you will not be one of those, but occasionally, unfortunately, you have a student or two like that, so if that happens. So uh, exams, there will be three exams and they are non-cumulative, which means uh, first exam will, um, uh, will cover a few topics and then once we're done with them, we are done with them. And so those topics deal primarily, as I said, with the national level of analysis. 
then there will be a few chapters or a few topics on the firm level and then there will be an exam. And so this exam will not be related to the first exam. So if you forgot everything that you did for the first exam, it's not a problem, it's not cumulative, it doesn't cover the previous chapters, only it's all in one third. And then the final exam, same thing, so it will not be cumulative, it will be just that one uh, last third. Although again, obviously it would be very beneficial to remember all of the materials that will happen. Um, there will be a participation component and that's basically every week you will have a little homework assignment. And so as long as you do those, you will get one point for each lecture and that will add up to a total of 15 points. And again, here um, I will not be too preoccupied um, with the sort of correctness and, and completeness of the answers. So we have the exams where you either know the answer or you don't. And if the answer is not good enough, you will not, good at, you will not get a good grade. Uh, on the homework assignments, uh, they're a little bit more like participation points. So as long as I see that you tried your best, we are good. So you don't have to do much else. And so that will, uh, you know, it will be more, as long as you try hard enough, you get your one point for each of those uh, assignments. And then there will be the Exculture project that I will talk more about in a minute. <clears throat> So exams, very easy. You will have 90 minutes to complete the exam. You will have several days to complete the exams. In the syllabus, I'll show you in a minute, uh, you have the timing for each of those tests. And so you can take it during, uh, any time during that window. So you'll have about five days to take each ex exam. But once you start, you will have 90 minutes to complete it. <clears throat> so you will not be able to stop once you start. And so uh, the exam questions, everybody will have, um, I believe it's 40 questions. So everybody will have the same length, but the questions will be coming from a larger pool of questions, <clears throat> which means that each of you will see a different set of questions. So they will be shown to you in a random order. So each of you will see different questions in a different order, but the questions themselves will also be different. I mean, obviously many questions will be the same, but most of them will be different. So my hope is that this way, you know, it will make it harder for you to sort of cheat and maybe, you know, observe one friend taking the exam and, you know, copying all of the questions and then, uh, you know, finding the answers and taking it that way. So historically, I haven't seen any problems with that, so um, hopefully it will be quite easy. Now, Exculture, let me talk about that. Um, uh, yes, there is a question? There was a question, no? Uh, let me see. When do you, when do you yes, go ahead. Again? When do you put the videos to YouTube? Already there. Already there. In fact, you know, let, let me scroll down so that you can see this and we'll talk about Exculture separately. So uh, your sort of main document, most important document is the schedule here or the important part of the document. And so for each lecture, for each week, you already have all of the materials there. Like for example, so this week we just do the introduction. <clears throat> so uh, that the link that you had, so all of that, you know, uh, that's what's happening right now. But the next week, uh, the topic will be the political systems. So basically the different political systems and how they affect or what it means for international business. So right here, you already have the link. So you just click on the link. It takes you to YouTube and you got the video lecture here. So you will, you know, okay. you will see my face here and you will see, uh, um, you will see the slides and you, can, you have the slides already and I'll show you. <coughs> And you can literally just, you know, either look at the slides on your computer on one screen and then watch the video on the other screen, or you just watch it and then you have the slides for your future references. I will be honest with you, uh, in many cases, you don't even need to watch it. I mean, I guess, you know, sometimes like when it's something like this, you want to see the slide and then apparently there is another one more here, you know, where you, you actually have pictures. But in many cases, you know, it's, it's the text that matters more. So which means that you probably can even just listen to those lectures or maybe have your smartphone or computer nearby if you need to look at the screen. But I suppose, you know, if you prefer just to listen either when you drive to you know, school or when you are, I don't know, jogging or working around the house, cleaning your house or whatever else you do. In most of the cases, I think it's perfectly acceptable and sufficient if you simply listen to the lectures. The only thing is sometimes it would be like, I wanna show you some chart or I wanna show you some um, I don't know, a map. In that case, you might want to take out your phone, take a look at that map so you know what's going on. And this is what I told you, as you see, you know, I put a lot of text on the slides. Now, fascinating topic. Okay. So this way, as I said, even 
uh, when you're preparing for the exam, you can just read it. it. It's short, it's not a lot of text, it's not like you have 50 pages of text to read, but you have some text here, and so that will allow you to, um, you know, to use the slides as class notes. Um, and so when you, we go further down the list, so here you have your video lecture, here you have your suggested readings. So if you have the Wild Wild and Hand textbook, you have the chapter three uh, assigned for this lecture. If you use that pre open source textbook, you use chapter 2.2. And then for your homework assignment, that participation point, you have here uh, a set of questions. I call them the green questions. I literally made them green so that we know which questions we're talking about. And so these are the questions that we will cover in the lecture. So these are the questions that we sort of discuss in the lecture, but I ask you those questions for your homework assignment. And so as long as you watched the video lecture or maybe even while watching the video lectures, you can grab the answers, or maybe you do some, uh, some research of your own, as long as you submit your answers to those questions, it doesn't have to be long, like a paragraph, maybe two paragraphs per question. I see that you've been following the uh, sort of the schedule. I, I see that you've been uh, watching the video lectures and participating in the course, I'll give you, give you the bonus. And so to submit those video lectures, again, same thing, all you have to do, you have the link right here. You click on the link and it takes you directly to the assignment. I already put your names here, so the 30 names that I got, so you just select your name. So for example, I don't know, Francis Jimmy. Do we have Francis Jimmy here, Francis Jimmy? Yeah, yeah so if, if Francis is doing the homework, so Francis does choose, chooses his name. The reason that I left here also the window for you to enter your name separately, uh, in the past at least, we had always some late enrollments and we also had some Erasmus students who were not in the system, whose names I was not given on, the, on time. So if you go through the list of the names and you don't see your name on the list, you just say, my name is not on the list, I will enter it below, and you put your name, I don't know, John Smith, right? John Smith, and then um, it's always a good idea to enter your um, VU, number if you have it so this way I know I mean first tell me if you're a VU student or Erasmus student and then your email address so I know who you are and so this way I will be able to identify you and then you have, so you have different uh, you know green questions they're exactly the same ones as the ones you have them here and you just answer them one by one you can type up the answers in a word file and then copy and paste them or you can do them type them directly here either way is fine and then you just basically you know. And so during the uh, video lectures, you will also be shown some questions that are likely to appear on the exams. And so just to make sure that you sort of are fully prepared for the exam, I put those questions here in the, in the participation homework assignments as well. So you will literally see this very same question in the lecture. You will see it here, you will answer it. Uh, and some of these questions actually will appear on the real exam. So as long as you watch the video lectures, you will even get to preview some of the questions and you will even, you know, sort of be not only familiar with what they look like and how difficult they are, but actually some questions you may have seen the actual exact questions. So that gives you a little bit extra time. And then you click and submit your work and you got your assignment. I will not submit it because I don't want Francis to have wrong answers because I randomly clicked here on the answers. But Francis, when time comes, you just select your name. And, you know. and it's the same thing for every, for every lecture. Oh, and here you have a link to the slides. In fact, in most cases, it's not only the slides, but also sometimes I attach some optional readings. So you have the slides here, but you have some additional readings and you have some additional stuff that you might want to use. And for some, of the, uh, for, for some of the readings, I even have an MP3 audio file. Uh, I ask my students to read them. And so this way, if you, so they are optional reading, so OR stands for optional reading, but if you want to learn more, you have some additional stuff that I found useful. You can read those articles, and for some of them, you will even have an audio file in case you just want to listen, if you don't want to, uh, if you don't want to uh, read the text. So again, I will check with the publisher if they allow me to also um, uh, give you the scanned, scan and give you the textbook. This is where I will also put the scanned chapters of the textbook so that you can read them uh, either print them out and have a paper copy or uh, read them on your phone. Uh, and then the same thing for every next lecture, same thing. So lecture number two, we will talk about economic systems and development. You have your video lecture, you have the reading from the textbook, you have your homework assignments, and then uh, you have your homework link. And then for the slides and optional readings, you have the link here. So just keep copying a copy of this PDF file but that's where you will find links to everything and you just basically move week by week everything easy everything simple 
The only thing that you will not find here yet is uh, the exam links. And so what we will do with the exams, let me scroll to the exam, we have the exam here, exam one. You will have the exam study guide. So you have a link here to a document that describes in detail what will be on the exam. So you have all of the topics, you have the description of the format. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the only thing is I see it says here 75 minutes. I give 75 minutes to my own students here in the United States with you assuming that maybe some of you are not uh, native speakers in English, I'll give you a little bit more time so you'll have 90 minutes instead. But other than that, you have a list of topics that will be covered on the exam, a list of issues. And so this will guide your preparation for the exam in case you need to, uh, in case you need to review uh, you know, what you need to know before the exam. But the actual exam link will be sent to each one of you personally. Uh, everybody will have a different link. And so I will set it right when the exam window opens and you will have that email and you can click on that link anytime you want. Uh, if everything goes fine, if Moodle works, I will actually put them on Moodle. So that may be even easier. But if we have difficulties with Moodle as it happened in the past few years, then you will have a link, direct link email to you. Uh, the system will send you a couple of reminders. So this way, if you lose that email or if you uh, forget to take it right away, it will remind you and you just click on the link, it takes you directly to the test which will look exactly like here. And so this way, uh, if Moodle doesn't, doesn't work or if there are some other problems, you will always be able to do it that way. Yep, that's basically the idea. Here as well for the live sessions, the ones I mentioned, uh, like for example, the live session we will have before exam one and then before exam two, same thing. So you have the link here. I hope that most of you will be able to be in the classroom all together. So this way uh, you can talk to other class students and we can talk. But no problem if you don't want to come in person. So again, I'll have to check the policy if they are okay with you not being there in person. But if, if it's allowed, you can basically join us from anywhere, you know, from home, from anywhere you are. And so the system Zoom allows us to have many participants. Uh, and so uh, you will be able to watch it live, but also there will be a button on the bottom of the screen. Let me see if I have one. I don't think I have it in my administrator's uh, window, I mean, uh, screen but you will be able to raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, you become sort of one of the conversation participants, just like in Skype, for example. And so you will be able to ask questions as if you basically are in the same room. So this way you don't even have to travel to campus if you're not on campus uh, to attend the meeting. You can still attend from home. We will talk live, uh, so that will not be a problem at all. Yeah, but basically that's, that's all about the schedule. Now let me talk a little bit, before we talk about Exculture, do you have any questions about, uh, about the format of the course and the course content uh, not related to the Exculture project that I will talk about separately now? So is everything more or less clear? Okay, well, when there are no questions, it usually means one of the two things. It can mean that everything is clear, everything's, you know, uh, no questions or everything is so confusing that I don't even know what to ask. So I'm not sure which one it is. <laughs> My hope is it's... Sorry for interrupting, but... Uh, like there's a question? Yeah, I have a question right here. Okay. Uh, like in the exam, are those open-end questions or just, uh, you know, uh, multiple choice uh, questions? Um, for the exams, it's all multiple choice, so there will be no open-ended questions. For the homework, it's mainly open-ended questions, but there will be a few questions, uh, sort of exam preview questions, those will be multiple choice. But for the exam, it's all multiple choice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is um, they tend to be a little bit more objective, but also I have a lot of students of my own here. I have you guys, and then we have 6,000 students in the Exculture project that I basically am responsible for. And so I kind of try to minimize my um, work workload. Uh, so if I allow you to write like essays, not only a little bit more subjective when it comes to evaluation, you know, does it deserve this grade or this grade, uh, but also it's a little bit more work for me. So therefore for the homework assignments, we have open-ended questions where you can express yourself, you can go in more detail. Uh, in your answers, uh, and so you can show your creativity and depth of analysis. But for the exams, it will be all multiple choice, so uh, that way, hopefully, it will be a little bit easier for all. More questions, please. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, like how many questions are there going to be? How many questions? Yeah. Uh, on the exam, there will be 40 questions, all multiple choice, so you will have 90 minutes. It gives you about, what, a little bit more than two minutes per question. 
And as I said in the past, it hasn't been a problem the timing, so most students are done much faster. But if you need the whole 90 minutes, you'll have the whole 90 minutes. Uh, by the way, I see that we have about five, six students watching online. Uh, so I see here Elisa, uh, Hilib, uh, Magda Magdalena. So if you guys have questions uh, on the bottom of your screen, you should have a, um, an icon that looks like a raised hand. And so if you click on that, uh, I will see it. And so I will add you here to the panel and we will be able to talk. So this way, if you want to ask questions, you can do it that way. Or also, if you're watching online, there is a button there that is called uh, Q&A, questions and answers. Again, if you have any questions, you can just type them there. Again, I will see them right away. And so this way, we will be able to answer them right away as well. Now, X culture. let me see, tell me if it's going to work. Um, um, or actually, maybe let's even do something else. Um, well, all right, let, let, me, let me try to show it through my screen. I wanted somebody to maybe go to the computer and just play it on your own computer. But so let me show you a very short video. It's three minutes, but this is a nice introduction of what X culture is and how it works. Time. Uh, let, let me just uh, here. So I'll show you a very short video about uh, sort of, you know, the basics of X culture. It's a project that you guys will all participate in as part of the course. And so let me show this video to you and then I will explain in more detail how things work here with the project. But I thought this cartoon will give you a nice initial pre preview. And so hopefully the sound and the picture will be good enough sometimes when it's my computer playing it and then won't resume to your computer. So sometimes the quality is not very good, but hopefully it will be good enough this time. So let's see if it's gonna work. So three minutes and then I'll talk more in, in detail, uh, uh, in, you know, with more detail after the video. Once upon a time, there was a professor who was teaching international business. But the students didn't like his course very much, because it was boring. You see, teaching international business in a classroom is like teaching how to swim in a desert. You truly need that real international experience to understand international business. So the professor started thinking, is there a way to make the course more experiential? And he thought, well, maybe if I could find a professor who teaches a similar international business course, in a different country, we could put our students together in international teams. And the students could work together on a project. Now that would provide a real international experience. The teams would have to deal with time zone differences and collaborate across cultures and borders. That would be like a real global workplace. So the professor sent out a call through the Academy of International Business. To his surprise, many professors from all around the world replied. And so the X Culture project was born. They started small, but the project grew, and soon enough, they had almost every country represented. Today, over 3,000 students from 100 universities in 40 countries participate in X Culture every semester. First, the student teams were working on business proposals for a hypothetical company. But then, real companies started approaching X Culture, saying, I have a business problem. With all the smart students in your project, can they solve it? Sure they can. Those students are really bright, and it'd be more fun for them to work on a real-life business problem. So now the students work on real-life international business challenges for real companies. Some companies even offer post-market commission, and some offer internships and even jobs to the authors of the most impressive business proposals. Moreover, the best students are invited to the X-Culture Symposium where they can finally meet their team members in person. For example, the previous meetings have been held at the Mercedes-Benz Truck and Bus Factory in Istanbul, the Home Depot headquarters in Atlanta, and at the Louis Vuitton Regional Office in Miami. Also, upon successful completion of the project, all students receive X-Culture certificates as proof of their international business experience. We've heard lots of stories of how those certificates help students land jobs. Xculture is also a great research platform. With all of those international teams and companies, there is no better way to do international business research. Sure, participation in Xculture is demanding, but it's the best way to learn international business. Plus, you get a certificate and meet people who may well be your future business partners. For more information, Go to xculture.org. All right, so I hope it worked. Uh, I hope you were able to hear the, uh, the text and uh, see the picture. 
but yeah, that's basically the idea. So the only thing is that the numbers in that video are greatly outdated. So uh, last semester we had about 6,000 students, not 3,000. And so they came from 150 universities or so, 154 if I remember correctly. And uh, we had also some non-student participants, so some professionals wanted to get, get that experience. And so they uh, came to us and basically asked if they can participate, we allowed them. So we had a total of 92 countries represented. So we had 43, I believe, countries by the location of the university. But because we had many participants who are not students uh, in other countries, so we had 92 countries last time. But this semester, we have, at this time, we have 111 countries. But again, we will see if everybody will survive because sometimes people sign up and some of them drop out before the project even starts. So we will see how many of them will survive. So we may lose a few, but at this time, we actually have participants from more than 100 countries. But yeah, the way it works is um, you will be placed on international teams. So there will be usually about six people, maybe seven people per team, with each team member in a different country. So let's say there are 30 of you, so each one of you will be on a different team. So it will be 30 teams, and then each one of you will have um, a different team, and your team members will be from somewhere else. So you may have one team member from the United States, maybe one from India, maybe one from China, maybe one from Kenya, and you will be from Lithuania, and then maybe somebody from Germany. And so that will be your team. And then again, let me go to the page where you can find um, more information about Exculture. So your resource page for the, for the project will be 2021A, uh, sorry, 1B, so if you're in the late track. And so here on this page, you will find um, a schedule and all the materials that you need. Um, so all of the dates, but this is also, here is the list of the companies that asked for help. And so you will be able to choose any company you like. We will probably add one or two more before your project, before you're placed on Teams. But this is sort of, you know, a collection of companies that you can already see. Like for example, we have this company from New York called Captive Voice. Uh, so they specialize in some software development for children with learning disabilities. Um, basically some software that allows them to uh, read any text uh, if they cannot read. So basically text to speech type of software. And then we have this company ZenCV from Italy. This company uh, specializes in uh, CV design, uh, curriculum, resume design and development, and then provides all kinds of other services related to looking for jobs. So uh, again, so they want some help with uh, expanding into new markets. Then we have Wood Earth Oils from Australia. They make canola oil. So they make oil, cooking oil. Not only cooking because some of that oil is used for other purposes, but you know they make uh, you know oil and so they are pretty popular in australia as well as they have some clients in uh, japan in china but they want to start selling their oil to more countries and they ask for your help then get out events it's a singaporean company so they specialize in event management for companies and what's interesting about them so the the, the symposium that we will have this year in singapore they are the partner and they're helping us organize the event then we'll have Exculture Kids. It's one of the Exculture owned, one of our commercial branches. Then we have a French company that makes cosmetics, uh, like all those lotions and creams. Uh, then my university has a problem and they would like your help. So University of North Carolina. Then a really cool company, Dark Drones. Uh, so it's a network of drone pilot schools, you know, like drones, uh, not airplanes, but unmanned drones. So they are now used in all kinds of industries, uh, police, news media, firefighters, um, architecture, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of applications, military. And so somebody needs to teach those people to fly those drones, to make sure that they know how to fly them, how to operate them, but also the legal issues, you know, where you can fly, uh, how you, you know, basically how the rules that regulate uh, drone operation. And so we have a company that has uh, a network of schools that trains pilots, and so they need your help there. And then one more day, it's a company, it's a small Italian company that makes um, apps that allow you to sort of productivity apps, so specifically for the students to make sure that you prepare for the test on time and stuff like that. So, and so you click on any of these links here and it gives you a detailed explanation, a detailed review of the company. Uh, so uh, it's in my Dropbox, it will look a little bit different, but basically you have description of the company. You have in this particular case, explanation of how the app works. So you have all kinds of stuff and then you have some questions that they need your help with. 
And uh, so your job will be to choose one of those many companies. And then once you choose the company, your job is to basically help the company solve their international business challenges. Um, that's basically it. So uh, there will be eight weeks when you will be working in teams. Uh, you will receive the names of your team members on March the 2nd. And then, uh, as I said, the, the project kind of has two purposes or two components. One is the international collaboration component. So the goal there is to give you an opportunity to put you in a situation where you can experience firsthand the challenges of working with people from other cultures. So the challenges of working across time zone differences, cultural differences, institutional differences, communicating online. So we will teach you a lot. So there will be a lot of training before it happens. Uh, you know, how to use all those tools and what can go wrong and what kind of conflicts you can experience and how to deal with them. But then also you will experience it in real life and you will be able to apply that knowledge to gain that experience uh, and basically become more proficient at international cooperation. But the second component is the business consulting component. So there will be real clients with real problems uh, asking you for help. And essentially you will work as a business consultant to your client company for, for that semester. So you will have live webinars with the company manager, with the company uh, CEO or owner. So basically you will do what business consultants do. And then when the whole project is over, you will have that experience, plus we will send you an exculture certificate, something that kind of looks like this, I have here an old one. But also uh, you will have a recommendation letter, uh, like five pages, where we will explain in detail what you did, what kind of experiences you gained, and so this is something you can take with you when you are applying for a job or maybe applying for a stipend uh, when you're going to, to, you know, to graduate programs. And so we have a lot of, a lot of stories uh, when those certificates, when that experience helps students get jobs. I mean, literally I have, in fact, you know what, I won't even show it to you. I literally have I don't know, hundreds by now, Here, let me just open up this. So if I go to like Exculture Stories, in fact, you, you, on the website, you can find some of those stories. Like if you go to the Exculture website, we have some stories told by the students, like, you know, they send emails. So if you go to Exculture Stories here, where is it? Exculture Blog, I guess it's not called. So you will find some stories that you can read and many of them are by students. But also, uh, let me see if I can find it right away. But I have, uh, how many stories I have by now? 138 email stories where students tell me, send me an email and tell me a story that goes like this. Uh, usually the email kind of reads like this. They say, hey, professor, you probably don't remember me or maybe you don't even know me. I took that Exculture project two years ago. I was at a university somewhere in Cape Town, South Africa. And so honestly, at the time when I participated in the project, I didn't even like it that much. Some of my team members were so far away, we could never schedule a meeting because there was always this time zone difference. And so it was difficult and I didn't even enjoy it that much because it was so much work. But yesterday I had a job interview. And so I come to the interview and there are like 20 other people sitting in the room waiting to be interviewed. And I'm like, oh man, I don't have a chance. How can I get a job when there are so many other people applying for this job? And so I come into the room and so there is an HR specialist interviewing me or a manager. And I start talking about my education and I start talking about my other stuff. And I see that the interviewer is kind of falling asleep. Like I understand that the interviewer has heard this story so many times. Everybody is the same. But then I say, hey, I also completed this Exculture project. So I was a member of a team and we had people in seven different countries. And so we had this client, I don't know, Good Earth Oils from Australia. So they had this business problem. And so we spent a whole semester trying to solve that problem. And in the end, we wrote our proposal. And so together it was difficult, but we worked across the time zone differences, cultural differences. So my international team developed a solution and so here is my certificate and here is my recommendation letter that explains what I did and how I did it. And hey, we even were able to, I don't know, secure a contract for that company. And so here is a thank you note from the owner of the company. And then the interviewer wakes up like, ooh, that's interesting, tell me more. So you work with people from like seven different countries. Oh, that's interesting, so tell me more. And before I knew it, I got the job. So thank you so much. I just wanted to thank you because you know, never thought that it would turn out like this, but it did. So thank you, professor. And so, as I said, I get a lot of emails like that, you know, several of them every semester. I hope even more stories like this happen. I just don't hear about all of them. But uh, yeah, maybe that will be you. Or likewise, if you will be applying to maybe, you know, like graduate program, MBA maybe somewhere at some point, 
again, that will hopefully help you. Not to mention that, again, over the years, we've had uh, participants, let me see how many universities have participated, something like maybe 500 total. It's like 150 or so in a given semester, but, um, but not everyone participates every semester just because, you know, not all the courses are offered every semester. But if you look, unique 652 universities have participated over the 10 years that we've been around. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe if, uh, if you will be applying to colleges, maybe it will be one of these universities. So maybe you can even find a professor there who, whom you can call, ask questions, maybe ask for a reference letter, you know, things like that. So yeah, last year, last semester, we had 6,000 people. Uh, there were 1,000, almost 200 teams, uh, 142 universities but it was 93 countries by the location of the students. So this year, I don't know the final numbers because some applications are still not uh, still coming in, but it will be probably about the same number. Um, and then at the end, as I said, we will have a symposium. So uh, last one we had here in the United States in November, so three, four months ago in San Antonio, Texas. Before that, we had one in Calgary, Canada. Before that, there was one in Italy, in, um, in uh, Macharaca, a small, small town in Italy. Uh, and then, so usually we have one in the fall in the United States and one in the summer in a different country each time. So the next one will be uh, Singapore. And then next year after that, it will be in the Caribbean, we will be on a cruise ship. So instead of a country, we will be on a cruise ship leaving from Miami and then visiting several countries and then coming back to Miami. So uh, hopefully some of you will be invited and will attend and I will have a chance to meet you in person. But uh, members of the best team, so we usually select about 40 best teams out of a little over a thousand. So they get invited by default, but then also students who did a good job uh, will be invited as well. And so hopefully you will be able to maybe meet your team members, meet your clients, meet some other companies. So it's a whole week. So we will visit a lot of different businesses, meet with the city mayor, meet with the uh, local politicians, uh, community leaders, so all kinds of things, uh, visit some interesting places and things like that. Uh, we even have uh, the first wedding. So we had a student, um, uh, he is from Italy and she is from the United States. And so they started corresponding during the project and then kept in touch after the project. And then both of them were invited to Italy two years ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, he proposed and she accepted. And so they got married and so we have a nice story. And now they're actually working for some business in Pakistan. So some, they both got a job with a company that does something in Pakistan and they actually now live in Pakistan. And so what's cool about that, so when, when they told me the story, they actually said that now they do for a living uh, what we taught them in X culture. So they live in a different country that is not the country where either of them is from. And so they work with people from all around the world. So the experience they gained as part of Exculture is actually something that they now do, you know, as part of their job. So it makes me feel very, very good about that. But yeah, that's basically what Exculture is. And uh, so, and I think I've covered everything I was planning to cover. So do you have any questions? Now is a good time to ask. So anyone, no questions? I hope that's because I explained everything so well, not because you're so confused, you don't know what to ask. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions later, uh, email me uh, or call me as discussed, and um, we will have, as I said, a few other meetings like this one where we will be able to engage and talk. But um, yeah, very nice to meet you, and hopefully it will be a good semester. All right? Before you go, I will ask you a question. So many Erasmus students, many students from somewhere else. So what countries do we have represented? Can you shout out the names of the countries where you come from? Germany. 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 Let's go one country at a time. So Germany. Guten Abend. Die geht's wie steht. So I'm trying to impress you. I used to yeah, spend quite some time in Germany, but ich kann noch alles verstehen. But I find it as sehr schwierig, Deutsch wieder zu sprechen. I hope you understood that. What cities in Germany do we have here? Excuse what cities? What, what, where exactly in Germany are you from? Mainz. Mainz, okay. Mannheim. Mannheim. Oh, we have actually a program. <laughs> My university has an exchange program with Mannheim, and so every spring we have Mannheim students coming to us, and every fall our students are going to Mannheim. So I may even meet some of your friends that will be coming, I think, next month here. So yeah. 
Yeah, I spent one year in München and one year in Köln, but it was a long, long time ago, like 20 years ago. So, so my German is a little rusty now. Okay, so what other countries? France. France, okay. Well, my French is not as good, so bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> that's, à la guerre comme à la guerre. that's pretty much all I can say. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I know that as well. All right. Very nice. What other countries? Portugal. Portugal. Oh, I've, I've never been to Portugal. You know what? I've been to many countries, but never Portugal. So that's a beautiful country. Hopefully, we'll have like an exculture symposium there someday. So very nice. What else? South Korea. South Korea. Oh, very nice. Yes. Congratulations on the Oscars uh, for the Parasites. So your movie got like two Oscars, right? Uh, two days ago. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, by the way, if you don't know, um, Greensboro, my little town, has one of the largest South Korean communities in the United States. So I don't know why. So we have some theories, but somehow we have a lot of South Koreans here. And we have a lot of South Korean businesses, like for example, Samsung phones. I have one of those, I have a uh, Galaxy Note. So some components of this phone are made in town here in Greensboro. So we have some Samsung factories here. So who would have known? Yeah, very nice. Uh, any other countries? Finland. Finland, oh, very nice. Very nice. Okay, yeah, I've been there a couple of times, uh, including, including last summer actually, so yeah. Any other ones? Spain. Spain. Spain, okay, very nice. So, it's a very beautiful country. Any more? Singapore. Singapore, oh, Singapore. So, I guess I will, hopefully, I will meet you in the summer if you go back to Singapore. So, okay, oh, Singapore, very nice. What is your home university in Singapore? Uh, Singapore Management University. Oh, SMU. So, that's the host of the, we, we actually have a lot of students from SMU in Exculture and they will host the, Singapore, the, the, the symposium in the summer. So Professor Gordon Perchold, um, he is originally from Canada, but now works at SMU, is our host there. And so we actually have a lot of good contacts there. So it's whole world. Yeah, very nice. Any more countries? All right, well, we have a nice cultural mix here in the classroom. That's very good. So very always helpful for the international business course. And I guess at this point we will stop. Thank you so much, and um, I hope I will see you again uh, in a few weeks in one of these meetings. All right? Bye-bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.